dude, you're talking maybe another year. It sucks. I'm not going to lie to people, though. I'm not going to take people's money. Uh, I'm not going to put other people's money into my company. I'm not going to launch this company until you see 20 games lined up in my house. I'm the complete opposite. I'm like, look, I'm building a low budget pinball machine company. I'm building everything from day one, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And if people don't like it, I'm, I'm not, you know, doing anything different. People just think, oh, you should just start a pinball company the cheapest, fastest way for money. No, I'm doing this because I'm, I'm a passionate research and design engineer and I want to do things my way. But I would say, um, you know, if I pull this off, right, and I build a game that's under 4,000 bucks, I think some people could go out of business. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's been a while, so I'm just going to give you a kind of small update and just kind of more talk about pinball and different ideas. Um, right now, honestly, um, it was a setback when my um, part supplier decided to do some things and have a fallout with me. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of doing some extra additional R&D for trying to build some extra parts in house. Um, and I'm hesitant to go with another supplier because right now, you know, <clears throat> I want to meet, you know, a business partner. I want to shake their hand and know who I'm doing business with. And right now I don't want to go spend a plane ticket and spend some time to go meet somebody that, you know, I don't have the product ready to go. And, um, yeah, you just you just don't know. I mean, I'm going to see what I can do in house and then if it's an option where I have to go out externally for certain parts, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um so yeah, I just been on vacation. I took some time off from that. It's probably been about 3 months since I touched pinball after that fallout. Um I went on vacation on a cruise, some different things. Spent a bunch of time, probably like 3 weeks or so, just um I started watching this guy Speed Char live on YouTube. He does uh, 3D modeling in a software package I use called Blender. Um, he does a lot of cool character art and stuff. So I followed him and I was learning some new techniques. So here's some examples of some artwork that I, I built in that three week time frame, which really took my art to the next level because I didn't do a lot of character stuff. And this all translates to um, you know 3D models and stuff that you can build as toys for pinball machines. So it's not like it's all lost and I have to spend my entire life and free time working on pinball, but you know, it's fun to create things and, and work on new art and stuff. So, uh, other than that, um, you know, I've been working on this, trying to build this company for like five or six years now. Uh, I think two or two and a half years could, it could be on pinball eternal alone. And I haven't released that product yet. Before that, I was just kind of tinkering around with my Megadeth prototype. So, you know, when you're not actually, you know, putting out products and people are playing them and love them and you're making income on it, you know, it's, um, it's not great. You know, you're spinning your wheels on the same product, trying to perfect certain things before you can get it out. So, um, in an effort, um, to kind of step back and, and take some time, uh, I designed a second themed game. Uh, one of the reasons for that was I wanted to just go in my pinball design software and upgrade it and, program the whole game virtually so that you could test it and kind of, you know, that's kind of my bread and butter, I think, is that I can build any game virtually in my pinball software, drag components here and there, press a button and play test those shots immediately. I don't need to go cut a piece of wood. I don't need to bend metal. I can design the toy. I can design how it animates and I can just play it. And all the programming you do there for game modes and playing this video clip and all these tweens for jackpot animations, that all just goes right to the you know the hardware out there because it's running a computer and it's it's running that same piece of software. It's just removing all the physics and three dimensional stuff that you're seeing on a screen. Um, it's just playing like the upper portion of the UI that would go on an LCD. So um, yeah, that's cool. Um, I spent a lot of time. I've been um, working on the manufacturing side for tooling. So I built um, a wire bender, which I'll show you real quick here. So. I had showed some things off before with my um, software in my uh, documentary. So here's me placing a wire form. This would be like an outlane um, ball guide. And you can see when I resize it over here on the right, it'll say it's 6.2 inches and then I can click it and drag it smaller. And now it'll say it's uh, 2.26 inches, right? And all that data, it says those are, um, that's all the data for bend angles and feed rates so that I can build these, um, shapes. So what I'm going to show you in another video here is just how I um, show those shapes being bent real quick, which is here, right? And you can see how it, it bends and feeds and bends. 
and normally that machine would cost twenty thousand dollars just to do that uh, and that was three years um three years ago before covid right so you're talking, um, they're probably $25,000 now. And you'll notice in the bend there, it's actually the angle's a little bit bad. It, it overbent, um, you know, I'm still iterating on my um, software on exactly how much motors have to move and things to bend pieces of steel. Um, and then here you'll see in my editor as well, I can basically build any wire form in 3D. Now you'll see it's kind of like really hard bent segmented, the smoothing, don't worry about that. We're, I'm working on the algorithm to build that. but. All that bend data right there gets exported and then you can see that the ball rolls and has physics in real time in the engine. So with my custom shop that I've always been talking about since day one, five years ago, you would open my software, you'd place flippers exactly where you want them, place scoops wherever you want them, um, and you can just drag and build that wire form around and you can play the game and everything that's in that software, every cut hole that would go to the board and play field to cut out a square or a, a little post hole, uh, all those wire form parts, um, they would all just go to machines and get built. So you could play it, send me the file, I would load all those files up and they would go right to my machines and be built. Um, so again, when I launch this company, I would like to have my custom shop ready because I don't really know exactly um, where this company is going to go or if my themes are going to sell tons, but maybe if I have a custom shop as well to make some you know, additional money. Um, what else has been going on? Um, yeah, again, uh, even like r and d for pinball legs. So if you look at how a pinball leg is, it's just angle steel, chopped, and then it's got some different shaping at the top. It's got two holes for the bolts, but it does, when it comes like this, it has that little bend that comes off the cabinet, right? It's not just straight angle. And there's not really any way that I have to do that unless you have like a 20 ton press or they're doing it a certain way. Um, if you look at Galactic Tank Force that American Pinball put out, um, because of how they did like their side tank tread thing, they actually didn't have it angled out because it would get in the way. So they just did straight angle iron, cut straight. And they sold that game for quite a bit of money and it had 3D printed parts too for toys. Um, what I want to do is maybe do straight angle cut. I don't like that it doesn't have the little bevel out. I'm going to see what I can do. but. If I cut it out there just like they did, but keep like the corners cut, the little trim that, that um, goes on a pinball leg, and maybe keep them straight, um, that, that might be an option for uh, what I end up doing. So yeah, man, um, you know, looking ahead and where I want to do and all these things I want to launch. So uh, I'm looking at maybe Free Play Florida Pinball Expo um, November, which is in November um, of 2025. That's a whole year and a couple months. Um, you know, things take time. I'm doing a lot of things in the background here. Uh, I'm planning to launch again with probably two themes. Uh, I'm not going to launch my company until I have 20 games built. I'm not going to buy a warehouse until I have 20 games built and sold. So, yeah, I'm going to build 20 games in my garage. I'm going to store them in my living room here. We're going to drag them to the expos and we're going to see if they sell. Um... Custom shop, again, I would like to have that 100% operational. I'm pretty close to that right now with my software. So uh, just the other day, it's kind of uh, I'm finishing up this right now with my software. So when you drag scoops or other components that need to punch holes where the ball would go, like again, a scoop cuts a big square hole out right before and it can go in. So in the virtual software, um, I can drag scoops, but I'm just now adding the feature where it would cut the virtual play field out so that the ball can go in and come right back out. Um, so there's a small example of a photo there, like how the algorithm works. But um, yeah, being able to punch out holes virtually into the play field and play it is, again, a big bonus. And then again, every time you place a scoop and rotate it and say it goes here, those four points are connected to it. So it knows. I need CNC points to cut out at that location. So again, this is all gonna be kind of like press a button and cut CNC, um, bend all the wire forms, blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, at this point, I think I'm the only company other than maybe Stern and Jersey Jack, uh, I don't know, even the Pulp Fiction guys, you know, Chicago Gaming, but um, it seems like a lot of newer places or places that came after Stern or so, they, you know, they don't have their own 
software that they're you know doing movie clips on the LCD and stuff and their own hardware so I feel like that's a huge bonus that right out of the gate I'm gonna own everything completely out I own my own software I have my own pinball designer where I can you know build and <coughs> play test these games before I even need to cut a piece of wood it also helps for a custom shop because I don't know any other custom shop that that does literally one-off games exactly how you want but I can send this to a guy in Seattle. He can build the game and then send me the file. I can build it and play it, make suggestions. I can program that entire game. Or um, I might have some of the programming um, available to them so they could put different sound clips and different things. And they might be able to program their own modes without even having any technical expertise. So, um, yeah, I'm in no rush really to go to the market. Um, you know, the longer I wait, the more financial savings I have. In case there's a risk or my business needs more money put into it um, I learn more things I still play more pinball I get better um, so yeah just some general thoughts on the pinball industry um, again I, I had always said this idea for a long time um, on some of the forums is you know the best designers um, they literally have zero experience in pinball so Scott Denisi did TNA it's this well-known game that everybody loves Jack Danger, Foo Fighters, first game, everybody loves, critically acclaimed. Elwin does Godzilla, his first game, no experience in pinball. Like, he's, he's held as the best designer now. So I think the barrier to get into pinball design is literally, it's, it's right in front of your face. It's zero years experience. Now, manufacturing is a whole different thing, but that's what I've been doing for five years, right? I've been, you know, if I can build, if I can draw a wire form and have it built in 60 seconds and put it together then I think that's pretty much proven that uh, my manufacturing experience is pretty well solid at this point on how I'm going to build these games. Um, you know, there was an interesting thing about the John Wick pinball machine with... Um, I watched a, a few videos where uh, George Gomez was talking about how there's all these laws or restrictions or, you know, even the ESRB, it's not a law, but it's a rating board for video games just to know if they're mature or for teens. It's not actually a law that I know of, or maybe in like California or something, I don't know. But hey, I just want to share this clip, because this is Dave and Buster's. I was just there um, before all this controversy happened. And here's a little kid holding a realistic gun playing the uh, Tomb Raider game. That's a Dave and Buster's, that's a family entertainment thing. So when he's saying like, you know, there's restrictions on intellectual property and have to get approval from, you know, certain people, that's someone that works on the John Wick movies as a producer or an executive that says, hey, we shouldn't have little kids playing guns. That's a suggestion. Um, I would have pushed back if I was the person. You know, whether that works or not, it's their IP. They can protect it. But the whole idea that there's this rating board and you can't have guns anywhere, again, here's a game with guns that a little kid is holding. And also, even another place that I play tournaments at, it's called District Eat and Play. And uh, they have a Pulp Fiction there, and there's guns on that game. So, yeah, I mean, as far as whether that's a hard-coded thing that you have to follow, it's that's not correct. That is 100% false. I also went and helped my uh, friend pick up a Pulp Fiction from a distributor. Um, I had some notes here and some photos. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, for some reason, the side of the cabinet... Well, Let's go through these videos one by one here because I'm not sure what I'm loading. Um, yeah, so there's just the Pulp Fiction um, we set up in his house there. Nothing fancy. Um, here's the side of his um, back box. I don't know what happened here. Um, <clears throat> he, he has it against two other games, so he was thinking, oh, I haven't seen it in a while. I, mean, I think it's just something I can rub off, but we rubbed it. It looks like it's just... I'm not sure. It looks like there's an issue embedded in the actual um, decal that was put on. Like it was smudged. It looks like it was smudged physically really hard and then underneath it's like inside of it. Because that's not just dust. That's not something that's just going to wipe off. It's definitely not like a, a tacky glue or anything. Um, yeah, I really don't know what happened there that messed it up so bad. So that kind of sucks. Um, another thing to know, this is just kind of like user experience, kind of my uh, review of certain things that they could have done better or that are cool. So here's on um, the back box when you want to get into it. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what's behind this nut that you need to open it. Um, yeah, but we, anyway, oh, I think, oh, okay. So these are the LCD panels in the front and then behind it is the electronics for like transistors and stuff. So I said, yeah, it's just open and I like to just take a look while we um, brought it in your house and I leave. So this little nut right here is really close to the side. It's hard to get a wrench in there unless you have like a straight on um, socket wrench that can attach to like a screwdriver. So that was annoying because I had to stick a wrench from the side. So here's the nut. We had well, all we had was like a wrench to go like this back and forth. It was really hard. You couldn't go from the front and do it because of the, it would hit. It's just so close to the side. I wish that would have been moved. It's like a minor thing that I'm complaining about, but man, if that were just moved a little bit, that would have been so much easier to get into. <clears throat> Here's their spinners they have. I don't know if I, I don't know if I've seen anyone talk about it or whatever, but um, their spinners actually have bearings on the side. It's a very interesting idea. I've never seen this before. I don't know if their Media the Landis games do it or if it's only like Pulp Fiction's the first game that did this, but yeah, they have two bearings on the side of their spinners. And then they're kind of like opto spinners, right? So they're not hitting a switch where it slows down. So if you look at the side over here. Um, I might have another photo of it, but um, on that right side, <clears throat> there's a magnet that has a north and south end. It's a really small magnet, and as it turns, there's a hall sensor, all right, a sensor that um, senses magnetism, and as it spins from here, it goes north to south, and then it goes off, and then when it comes back, it turns on. So this sensor is detecting that magnet spinning. So again, it's basically like an opto spinner, except it's not using infrared it's to detect a switch spinning. It's detecting the magnetism. One thing to note though is uh, in this video, if you watch it and time it, this really, with all these bearings inside, um, that's me spinning it pretty hard by hand. I don't know if the ball would do any more, um, you know, mass against it quickly to spin it more, but I did a lot of testing by hand um, with the uh, spinners that I made that were opto spinners. And this might add like two more seconds maybe to a spin. So I think it's kind of overkill. Um, yeah, it's just too much work, I think, for, the, for how many extra spins you would get. This is pretty cool. So if you've ever seen like tournaments or gone to a place where they change the um, outlaying post, uh, if you look down in there, you see they actually drilled out three different, um, those are threaded. So if you wanna go like really hard, and bring it you know, inward more towards the inlane so that the inlay's um, wider open or sh smaller so it's easier. Um, you can just unscrew it and screw it back in from the top. Whereas I think every other company, you actually have to pull the post out so you have to lift the play field up, get under there. There's a bolt or a, yeah, a, how is it? a nut. There's a nut down here and then you unscrew it from the top and then you have to move it and then screw it back in like that. Whereas this, it's all threaded from the top, so you pull it in and you can put it in one of those threads. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Um, it was a pain though, cause we, I don't know if that board is cut wrong. I wish it was maybe just the wood was cut more because if you grabbed it and um, we tried to move it to one of the post lanes or put it back in and it was hard to really line it up that screw to get back in. But yeah, very cool idea. That's just the under <clears throat> underplay field right there of the Pulp Fiction game. If anyone's curious. And then this was cool too. I don't know if this is how the hinges were made um, by other games. If like Bally Williams did this or something. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a video of it working, but here's the hinge. And it does like, it's hard to describe, but the way it locks is pretty cool. Um... That's all I can say about it. You'd have to look at it or have somebody send a video, but it's kind of cool the way that you, you know, lift the play field, pull it up, and then put it back in. You don't have to go behind the play field, lift it up like stern, and then slide it back in. Um, maybe I'm just dumb and I, I don't, I don't any, own any really old games, so maybe they're all done like that long ago, but that was pretty cool. One other note for Pulp Fiction that I wanted to talk about is that... Um, my buddy had Pulp Fiction, and um, when you plunge the ball, it goes up, and then it kicks out of this little hole, and then it hits the pop bumpers, and it starts bouncing around. Well, if you go to the local arcade, 
there's a setup uh, from the manufacturer that the pop bumpers, if you look at this photo, you can see they're pretty high. So the ball hits it and it doesn't actually roll onto it. It just kind of hits the pop bumper and, and goes away. So um, again, this is two different user experiences, but he noticed that he's like, yeah, when the ball pops out, it doesn't hit the pop bumpers and go all crazy, but mine does. So that's, is that a manufacturing defect? I would think it's supposed to hit the pop bumpers and I don't know what's going on there, but again, it's just something to take a note of. Uh, I played, uh, I only played one game of Elton John, maybe two. Um, it's not enough to really review it, but I can say I played at a distributor. I played, played two games of John Wick and two games of Elton John. And I don't know, man. Um, it's just the wick felt better. I don't know what it is. Stern's games, it's just the flippers. Um, you know, the, the flippers do feel better on um, Elton John. I just, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I'll have to play it more, but again, right away I knew, like, oh, John Wick, it hits hard. Um, you know, I wish there were more, more toys and stuff. It's fun to play. I mean, I don't mind it so far. I'm trying to learn more of the rules and stuff. Um, you know, one other thing I wanted to say about tournaments is my friend owns an Iron Maiden and him and his son went into a Stern Pro Circuit at Free Play Florida last year. And, uh, there's a skill shot where you plunge it, right? Every plunge is a skill shot. It's called skill. You're supposed to learn it and, you know, get a skill. He plunges it into the out lane for the, I guess it's a 5 million jackpot. And instead, it gives him no jackpot, and it ruins his entire ball one. And it's like, hmm, you know, you just, he made that kid not even want to play the game because he's like, this game's broke. Like, what, what happened, right? Like, you can't take away gameplay from someone that's been training on that game in their house for a year. And when you go to a tournament, you say, no, that's not how the game works, and you're a piece of trash player because he hit that on his first shot. That means he's a really good player. It's called skill shot, skill. Let him hit the ball, let it get in there five million and then get it back. Every player's on the equal playing field. I cannot believe that's the worst user experience I've ever heard of in my life for a product. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I'm, I've seen worse user experiences, but that is stupid. Um, and you know, when we went to the distributor to pick it up, I played a few games here and there and uh, he had said, Oh yeah, here's all the new Elton John and all the Jersey Jacks we got here upgraded with the new driver board. Yeah, it's like some people have these, you know, on pin side or talking about upgrading the capacitors and blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, it's 400 bucks. Like you spent 13 grand. And I'm like, I didn't tell him, but I was the guy that was literally hard pushing everybody. Just upgrade your capacitors. Here's the circuit board. I've analyzed it, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it's kind of funny that this guy was saying that I didn't want to get in a whole back and forth with him. It's not worth it. But I, I you know, <clears throat> when you say it's only $400 uh, on a game you spent like 12 or 13 grand on, first of all, that game's 13 grand. And on their website, they're the best pinball company in the world. I would think your flippers would have to be up to par and they're not. And a lot of the people I've met over the years newcomers and I think even some of the older guys I mean the only people that I know that own Jersey Jack games or talk about them are older guys the younger crowd they love Stern they love the speed they they always tell me why are you I, I like one Jersey Jack game and that is uh, Willy Wonka I think it's just because I played it so much one day trying to get the high score I played it for like two hours and I'm like all right it's got some pretty cool shots um, the Wonka Vader lock is cool Without that though, on the lower end model, without that lock, it's like kind of lame. Um, but uh, yeah, JJP is a, a hard sell for a lot of people coming in and um, I still don't play their games a whole lot. I'm, I play pretty much Sterns all the time. I like some of the old, um, some of the old games like Circus Voltaire and stuff, Medieval Madness. I mean, there's a lot of pretty cool games that have cool features that you see that you know, you've never seen before, and you're like, wow, they were doing a lot of cool stuff back in the day. Um, but back on that board set, so if I bought a Lamborghini and it cost me a hundred thousand bucks, and then literally the next day someone's at that dealer says, Oh, you went on the highway, okay, yeah, you can go 70 miles an hour, but you can't go 75, you have to pay an extra 400. 
I don't care if it's $400 in addition to hundred grand. You shouldn't have to spend $400 to get working product. It's crazy to me. And I think everybody should just put new capacitors in there. There's no reason, I mean, unless you just don't have the time, don't want to, I mean, it does take work to cut it out and take the board apart and solder them in. I mean, it just depends if $400 is worth it to you or not. If it's not, then, you know, just buy the board. But I think the idea that it's like, well, just spend more money. It's, it's only $400. It's like, man, I, I, I guess everybody's just super rich and just doesn't care about money. I don't know. <clears throat> So American pinball, uh, just some things I, you know, I, this is kind of me just talking about pinball in general over the years of, of things I've read and noticed and, and gone over and we'll talk about. American pinball is an interesting one because you find out at some point that it's owned by Indian nationals. Um, they named the company American pinball and now that they're the parent company, which is a circuit board manufacturer, um, they're trying to, their parent company is trying to sell off and they're not even selling it on the American stock market. It's going to the Indian stock market. So it's kind of like false advertising here. Like, uh, is it really American pinball? I don't, I'm not sure of that one. I don't care who makes pinball, but you know, just be honest about it. You know, there was one time I went to, um, I've had my circuit boards built in China. It's pretty easy because you can point and click and they have so many components and it just comes back done. Um, here, I think you have to have someone fetch the components, whether it's you or the, the people that are making it and whatnot. So, you know, I still would like to build those in the U.S. at some point. Um, and a couple of years ago, I'd reached out to some companies. I just did Google search on um, USA circuit board manufacturers, blah, blah, blah. I hit up a couple of them. And one of them, it was so crazy because it says on their website, we're the oldest circuit board manufacturer in the United States. I don't remember the name of the company. I got a quote online. I was like, oh, that's pretty cheap. You know, that's cheaper than what the other American made ones were gonna be. And then I think the lady called me and I said, yeah, you know, that was pretty cheap, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, oh, no, no, no I'm sorry. The, the initial quote we give you is for a board to get made in China. And I go, well, why would that be your default quote if you're advertising American made on everything on your website? And anyway, <clears throat> that went wherever it went. I was really annoyed by that. I, I wrote, I think the owner or something, I said, you know, I took a screenshot of the thing that said, this is American made, the oldest printed circuit board. I said, why would your default quote be for a Chinese board? I mean, I can already do that. Like, you know, and they were saying, oh, well, even the Chinese ones, they wanted to get a ton of money too, because I'm already getting my boards made in China. They wanted a bunch of money on top of that for the Chinese board, and I'm like, what? They're like, well, well, we get them done good and this and that, and uh, we translate all the paperwork. I'm like, dude, I press a button, I get a circuit board built and shipped to me. I don't need to talk to anybody in Chinese or English or anything. I just send them a file, it gets manufactured, and it comes back to me. So, <clears throat> anyway, just rambling. The other thing about American Pinball, which is super weird, again, when I decided I wanted to build a pinball company, uh, yeah, I was going to build my play fields in-house. I was going to build my cabinets in-house. I was going to build my own hardware. Components, um, you know, flippers and stuff, I didn't know exactly what I was going to build, but I would think if you're owned by a circuit board manufacturing company that you would build your own circuit boards day one. And I couldn't believe when I heard that, that they just now made their own circuit boards at American Pinball. And I thought it was crazy because I listened to an interview with of them, I don't remember what podcast it was, where he said it would it cost them like hundreds of thousands of dollars to research and design or whatever with this pinball you know, hardware. And I was just like, dude, it's so out of touch. When you look at what I've done and what I'm going to release for the little bit of money I put in to say you need a hundred thousand dollars of R and D or whatever they did that he's saying this number. I mean, unless it's like they built the boards and they have a hundred thousand dollars worth of boards. I don't know. But if it's a hundred thousand dollars to R and B R and D and pay somebody to get a board designed, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, what else? You know, I did see their the American Pinball um, tour, which was, I had a couple critiques. Um, again, this was one where he was just saying, maybe I'll play it or not, but he was saying, here's our cabinets and um, they're all built outside of their factory. They bring them in. It almost sounded like he said overseas too, but I, I really, really doubt that they're building their cabinets overseas. But 
Um, it's possible, who knows. Um, JJP builds their play fields, they get them manufactured in Germany. So they get all these play fields built, assembled, spray coated, and then shipped from Germany to the US. You're talking heavy pieces of wood with some inserts or whatever else they got, and then they bring them into JJP. So I'm not sure why they don't just cut and build those in the US. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, again, this is where American Timball is saying, you know, look, we're literally in a PCB manufacturing warehouse right now where we build our pinball machines and yet we don't build our own circuit boards. Makes no sense from a business standpoint. Um, this was an interesting one, right? Because he's showing off this play field to these guys for their tour. And um, he's talking about the inserts, how they get them done. Here it is from the back. Um, and he says it's a proprietary patented process. I can't find it anywhere if anyone knows who makes that play field for them or what um, he actually has granted as a patent. But um, that was an idea I think I had. I'm, I'm assuming this is what he's doing. He cuts them out, he puts like a sheet on it, turns it upside down, and he just epoxy fills it with a white milky like um, tinted epoxy or some kind of resin. And then because there's something here, it doesn't drip out and then it cures however fast it cures. And then it's just a milky white resin because he says it's built into the wood and you can't bring the, you can't get the insert out he says so i'm assuming it's resin right into it and i noticed spooky does the same too if you ever look at um one of their games you'll see that when the game's off or there's a light that's not on it's milky white by default it's be, and he says that or someone said um, that spooky does their play fields the same way with this same company so anyway again you look at the insert you'll see it's milky white that's because it's designed the same way um they if you look at more of like the insert ones, they're usually clear inserts that are hammered in and they have different like interior designs, the way they reflect and stuff like my Foo Fighters or any Stern game. When you look at the arrow, it's got like all those bumps inside of it. That's because it's cast and then pounded in to give a different effect. But you'll, you'll notice that. So that's what's crazy though, is if that is actually patented, that was one of my ideas. That was my idea before the one I showed in my documentary of how it was gonna do insert lighting. And I bypassed that, so now I don't even have to do resin. And I have the same result as what they're showing you off right here. Because he even says, I can cut any shaped light into this wood, and so can I. And I can do it way quicker and way cheaper. Uh, here was another video of the tour that I watched. You know, he's just saying, yeah, look at all these parts we get. We get them for like one or two pennies. If you go to a... Uh, a normal pinball website as an end user, you're going to pay 50 cents, 25 cents, a dollar for all these different parts. So again, people just, <clears throat> you know, if you want to be the cheapest company as possible, and you're again, you're looking at a lot of parts that are built for a couple pennies. And then on top of that, you look at the stuff that I'm building. If I can build my own wire forms in an easy and cheap way, I mean, dude, my cost to build pinball machines is going to be nothing, guys. And that's why I'm going to get away with this. And I also don't have to pay a CEO or a VP that just sits in his office and doesn't do anything. I do all the software. Nobody's ever going to program my video, my um, my games. You know, this is all my own design software. It's going to be all my own code on every single game. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be all my own playfield designs. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll do a contest sometime, and then the community votes and says this is the game we want. And if they put down the the money for it, then we do that and we go with somebody else's design. Maybe I hire someone some at some point, but. I'm the programmer. I'm doing all that work. I'm, you know, I'm not just going to sit in an office and collect paychecks. And then again, the other thing you think of is <clears throat> when you look at getting every part that you get done externally, you're not just paying parts and labor. You're paying an overhead for that parts and labor because they want to make a profit on it. Um, and then they also, the owner wants to profit. So let's imagine you have a company that um, makes $50,000 worth of product, right? What do you think that owner wants to make? Just every year it makes 50 grand. He, the owner of that company probably wants to make 100 to 150 grand. So again, you're paying the salary of that guy for his one worker that just makes this one product all year round for 50,000 bucks when you could just have that worker in house and pay them, all right? And that's why I'm trying not to outsource as much as possible. And that's why some people don't get like, oh, why would you reinvent the wheel? Why don't you just go and buy all this stuff? because I'm gonna build the cheapest pinball company in the world. P 
period. That's why I'm doing this. And if I can't build a part, then, you know, I lay down that and I, you know, I don't have any problem buying a part from somebody if it's a reasonable price. But if I could build it cheaper, if I found a way to do it, if I didn't, then that's cool. But if I do, then that's the cheapest way, right? If with parts and labor and time and throughput of building products, it makes sense to build it in-house, then that's what I'm going to do. So let's just talk about some other companies. Um, Spooky, uh, I like them, man. I just don't like any of their games currently. That sucks. Um, Scooby, the upper play field, once you get up there, I think you just sit up there for too long and... I can stay up there for a while, and the ball's too slow, so it just seems kind of like really slow, boring gameplay. Um, I haven't played Looney Tunes, though, and I haven't played Texas Chainsaw, so those actually look pretty cool. I'm um, just watching the videos. I think they look good, so hopefully, you know, I got a, I got a, a lot of respect for Spooky. I think everybody should watch their documentary, um, pay the couple dollars. You can find it pirated on, like, a website, but, you know, pay the few dollars. Some guy did a documentary on Spooky about how they were founded and all the details of that and it's really interesting and you know you got to respect a guy that would put up his house well I wouldn't do it right I wouldn't put my house on the line to build a pinball company but um, you got to respect that he used his own money and his own intelligence and his own words to build that company and you know the bottom line of that documentary is like he builds his first game uh, he quits his job goes full-time puts his house on the line and he comes back and has like one order for the game you know that's not sustainable and so they're really lucky. They're really fortunate. Um, I think they're very uh, humble people, and I think they did it the right way on their own, with their own time and money, and now you see his kids are taking it. And Yeah, I think they're good people. <clears throat> Haggis, man, anyone that's seen what's going on with Haggis and the whole collapse, that's just pathetic, dude. I, I don't know how you could have millions of dollars worth of investments or money and deposits and stuff, and you can't make a pinball machine company work after that much time. You know, I haven't even launched yet, right? So if you want to judge me at this point, I guess. Um, you know, I, I did want to launch a couple of years earlier. If somebody wants to talk some BS about that, yeah. You know, I it sucks. But, you know, my designs have evolved and i put more time. And now I'm actually building some other machines so I can manufacture different parts um, that I couldn't build before. Um, but, yeah, Haggis, I think what happens is a lot of people go... They, they hear the price of pinball machines, like some of them are up to 15 grand, and they're like, really? And then they go like, let's let's do this, right? I can buy a piece of wood and cut a piece of wood um, and install these mechs and it should be just good, right? So whether it's a motivation of you know going into it that I want to steal people's money or I'm going into it to make an honest business, I think people, that's a lot of it is motivated by greed and they think it's easy profits. Um, but yeah, millions of dollars couldn't make it work. I know there was one guy on a forum that uh, he wanted me to sympathize. Like, oh, he made all his own parts and this and that, and it's hard, and his product is so cool. Well, yeah, he doesn't have a business now, right? You can launch a business two years early with millions of dollars, but that's not a business unless you know what the heck you're doing and you have your product going out the door. So, yeah, I, I got no sympathy if I'm doing the same thing and I'm not taking a, like anybody's money at all. Um, you know, the red flag, they had an escrow account and also Turner had the same thing where it's like, oh, you know, we, we don't really need the money, but you should give us the deposit money. But, you know, so we'll just put it in an escrow account. Right. And, um, we won't touch any of the money. We promise you, we don't need it all, but please give us money, but we don't need it. I, yeah, I don't really understand that. Um, even some of those games that Hag has built, it sounds like a lot of them have hardware or software issues and. You know, this is something that, again, I own everything, every electron in my workshop, every electron in my game where these go and flow through computer logic, I own everything. So if there's a bug in my software, I'm going to fix it in two minutes. You just tell me what the issue is. I'll go in the code. I have millions of lines of code. I know where everything is, and I'll go look it up, and I'll fix that issue for you. No problem. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, let's go on um, Turner. Yeah, again, he had the escrow um, account thing I, I don't know why it just looks kind of stupid right it looks unprofessional um it's weird that he came out his game was ten thousand bucks and then all of a sudden he's like oh shoot yeah we got no sales like I, I think it was don or somebody asked him and it was like yeah we don't have any sales it's unfortunate it's, nobody's gonna give money for a ten thousand dollar game with a company that nobody knows like, it's pretty obvious right you should know this day one um 
then all of a sudden it goes from seven k to or sorry ten k to seven thousand bucks overnight. It's like where did that three grand go? So you just wanted extra three thousand bucks. I feel like because you wanted to make more money, right? And he added a coin door. He added powder coating. He made he's his cabinets bigger with more wood. So you're adding features while you reduce the cost three grand. Like that seems a little bit weird to me. Um, there's also plans he says on his website to increase the price already. He hasn't even sold out or yeah, I don't know. So at this point, there's obviously not a hundred games sold, which is what his goal was. <clears throat> so I guess we can only really say he has maybe nine. You know. We know he's got 99 or less. So if you look at 99 games at his price point and all the money he's put in, you know, when he started it, he bought $50,000 in assets from a company who worked at prior that was a scam and took all their assets. So like literally day one, he put 50 grand cash or check and I'm not even at 50 grand, right? He's got a team of three to six people. I don't know if they're splitting the profits or he already paid them. I mean, this is a lot of debt that you've taken on for a product that you wanted to sell at 10K, 100 copies. That's a million bucks. Now you're going at 7K um, for 100 uh, copies. That's 700,000. You already got to write all these checks to these other people. You got to pay taxes. Like, we'll see if it works out or if it's worth it. I mean, if he could get 200 orders, sure. Um, where he's at, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe he'll get there. I mean, I don't, you know, if he makes a good product and people get it and they like it for 7,000 bucks, even if they liked it for 10K, I don't care. But <clears throat> I knew that 10K wasn't gonna work. And I think where he's at and where he's, some of the things he's done is a little bit strange. Remember, he had $100 he wanted for a pre-order deposit to be on an email list that didn't go towards the pre-order deposit that was on his website. So you're like paying him $100 just to get a comic book and then be on an email list so that when they're taking pre-orders, you can then give them another $1,000. It's kind of weird. None of that makes sense. None of this stuff makes any sense. Uh, I've been in business my entire life. I've been thinking about running businesses my entire life. I've been building my own software my entire life. Um, another thing is like he's the CEO of his own tech company for 10 years, but he doesn't write his own software. For pinball and and then the hardware he buys for 50 grand so it's a little bit weird um again i don't care what you know you get the fruits of your labor if he's willing to do it then you know good luck to him and you know i don't know i'm just waiting to see and i'll judge him when the day comes to actually judge him but so far it just looks really strange um again the guy had been in deep root for four years which was a scam company obviously he should have known ten thousand bucks wasn't going to work I think he should have known the market a little bit better when he got into it. Um, you know, some of his speeches are like, oh, well, I'm just going to do what everybody else wants. And, you know, I'm the complete opposite. I'm like, look, I'm building a low budget pinball machine company. I'm building everything from day one, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And if people don't like it, I'm, I'm not, you know, doing anything different. I'm keeping my price where it's going to be. And I've, you know, held that from day one. Like, I'm not in this to build a company that has $7,000 games. I, because I... Again, I got a Foo Fighters, it cost me seven grand. The only reason I have that game is because I'm in the pinball business, technically. Not yet, but you know, that's the only reason I have that game. I'm not gonna buy another game. I don't think I'll ever own two games at once. I mean, it's $14,000 to play pinball in my house. I don't think it's worth it. Um, and I, you know, I like enjoying going out to the bars and stuff, you know? I don't wanna sit inside all day, so I like to go out and, you know, play pinball with people and see all the new games. It's, you know, it's fun, so. Um, you know, if at the end of the day, my motivation isn't, you know, it is to get rich, hopefully, but, you know, I put thousands of hours into skateboarding for no reason, right? Learned all these tricks, you know, you're talking 4,000 hours when I was younger. Uh, I learned how to play guitar. Like, none of these have, I didn't do these as motivations to make money. It's something that I wanted to do and learn and, um, you know, really advance and understand how these things work. And it's the same thing with pinball. That's why I started looking at every single part how to make them, how it works. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I was gonna play this clip that I, I found. Um, what I found is interesting is that Gary Stern says for 70 years, he's never even thought about designing a game or had any passion towards wanting to really di dig into games. He just wants to be the boss. All right, well, so, okay, you, you've been in pinball for a very long time. Uh, Se 73 years. Yeah, so have you, ever wanted to design your own game have you designed your own game and no i haven't so yeah i mean gary stern honestly with his money and you know his dad's money um they're the only reason we're probably even talking about pinball right now i mean money has a purpose and 
you know, the volume of games that they put out that we all enjoy and all this stuff, you know, you have to have a lot of money to do that. So, you know, good for that. Um, you know, I don't want to judge him his entire life just on that one comment, but just on that comment, it's like, you know, you've, uh, you know, you worked in pinball for 73 years. You never thought to like tinker around and make your own game. You never thought to design a game, you know, Tony Hawk, like it's the other say way around with a lot of people. It's like, you know, they were a famous skateboarder and they owned a skateboarding company. Eddie Van Halen was a really good guitarist. And then he built his own um, EVH line for guitar amplifiers. So, um, yeah, a lot of people have said, well, you know, you, what you're doing, Adam, is really stupid. You're reinventing the wheel and all this stuff. Why would you do that? Well, I, again, I've talked about price points of scoops and flippers that I can build. But I would say, um, you know, if I pull this off, right, and I build a game that's under 4000 bucks, if I can build one for maybe $3,000, I don't know, maybe I'll have a line for under 3000 still at this point. You know, maybe one of the themes will be cheaper. I think some people could go out of business. There's a couple companies out there with plastic on their play fields that could go out of business just like that. And if not, even if that, if I were to only build 50 games a year, right? And let's say I do this for three years or just a year, whatever. If I get traction and I'm just doing this as a side business for 50 games a year at the price point I'm at and they're fun and they got a lot of cool toys, right i think there's going to be a backlash in the market because people are going to see what they can get for that price and it's going to they're going to be pissed they're going to go at other people i mean there's a lot of discussion about toppers toppers are two thousand dollars you're telling me for three thousand some dollars i can get a pinball machine i think that's pretty significant so yeah i mean if i were a multimillionaire, if i were a gary stern right now and for 70 years of my life i'd still I, i'm a passionate guy in different hobbies I would still want to learn how to program I'd want to design my own pinball machines you know so it's like people just think oh you should just start a pinball company the cheapest fastest way for money no I'm doing this because I'm I'm a passionate research and design engineer and I want to do things my way um you know even like multimorphic I remember this guy was getting in a fight with um flipping out because he was supposed to showcase his games at southern fried gaming like a few years ago it's like dude why don't you just Go out to the expos yourself and showcase your product if you believe in it and you're selling them for 12 grand. Like you should have the money to buy a plane ticket for a couple hundred bucks and stand on the show floor and say, hey, I'm the owner of this company and nice to meet you. That's what I do. I mean, even Turner, right? You got to give them credit, right? They are a team of people. They built a product. It seems to look nice. People are buying it. Um, whether it's sustainable or not, again, I don't know. But, you know, they're putting in the work, the efforts there. They've built a product. You can't take that away from them. Um, you know, and they have all the ingredients for success. So we'll see what they do with it. So I actually wanted to go through um, some stuff with Foo Fighters um, because I own that game and I wanted to kind of just get some thoughts about it and talk about, you know, my experience as a product designer for 20, 25 years. Um, and things that I see. Um, and again, talking to other players all the time. I talk, I go out there and I, um, I go to a bar every Friday, or mostly every Friday, at least maybe twice, once a month. Um, sometimes it's every week uh, on Friday. Um, and I play with people, and I get to know them, and I talk to them. A lot of them are newer players. Um, there's a wide range of people. Um, I also go, like, there's a tournament right before that on Friday at another bar. Um, and so I go there, play the tournament for an hour, and then I go to the other one and play till midnight. And... Um, yeah, I meet these people and um, I do play a lot of pinball and uh, people give me feedback on ideas and, and things that they see that are done wrong or whatever. And um, so with Foo Fighters, I'm just going to kind of go through my thoughts here, right? So first of all, I got the game, right? there. I didn't know about rule sheets um, online. I don't even think every game that Stern has has one, but there's a big PDF that's like 20 pages long. So I was on the Foo Fighters... Um, Facebook group and on Pinside forums and a lot of people were like yeah I don't know the rules I don't understand them, whatever and I I would say just me alone I sent uh, the PDF link to probably 30 players and said yeah there's a PDF by the way this is not listed anywhere in the manual for the game it's not on the LCD on on the freaking rule set play card it doesn't say visit Stern's website for the complete rules for this game this is a horrible user experience because people have no idea how to play it or where to f even find the information about I'm playing it. Now, the rule set itself, uh, we'll talk about later, but it really doesn't give you that much information. So, um, again, that was the first thing is nobody knows the rules or where to find them. 
Um, one thing I don't like is the songs reset after every game. So if I'm just going up there and playing the game and I want to hear Everlong, on ball three, if I lose it before the song is over um, and I go to start a new game, Everlong resets. I want to hear the song Everlong. Like, let it just play out and let me rock on, right? So that's annoying. Um, I think when you, you know, I've said this before, when you do song select, I don't know why it engages the flippers. Um, you know, those flippers do wear out, and every time you hit it um, for song select, it's wearing down the metal parts. So I don't know why that's on. Uh, I've talked about it before. I estimate it could, it could be like 1%, 2% of the overall lifetime of that part. But hey, you know, it's 2%, you know, save, save the game a little bit extra time before it completely fails on that part. Um, I've noticed mode continue after death, so they actually fixed this, right? Um, you know, if you failed a mode, um, you had to requalify and get back into it. Now that game and some other games will let you carry on modes. Um, you know, after you qualify for it, if you lose the ball, you're still in that mode. Or on Foo Fighters now, um, you have to just shoot it up and then start the mode again. So that's uh interesting but i had that idea is that like you know keep the mode going because you've qualified for it you know let people play the game a lot of people have a hard time playing these games believe me guys um there's a lot of things that could be improved for beginners um whether it's outright beginner mode which is what i'm planning to do or like hardcore mode so beginner mode would be a little bit different um you qualify for multi balls quicker um ball drains different things um can be done um, in the code and dynamically to make uh, the game a little bit funner because I got to be honest on Foo Fighters I've only gotten to the mini wizard mode I think twice and I probably have 600 some games on it I'm not the best player that's for sure but that's unfortunate so if there's a way that I could play longer I mean you can add more balls but then it's kind of, that's cheating so I wish there was maybe there's just a different mode that's beginner mode that lets people play. Um, I've talked with a distributor that said, yeah, I met you before we talked, you know, and this is a stern distributor. He said, I wish that there was a mode like you could just continue play um, or carry on from where you were so that you could experience the whole game. I've still never played, I played one mini wizard mode on this game. I've never gotten the wizard mode and I've never gotten the other mini wizard mode. There's a bunch of stuff I haven't done on Foo Fighters. So it'd be cool to be able to see all that without having to be like the best player in the world, right? Um, again, on the rule sheet, it just says collect FUBOT. Like, what does that mean? Give me an explanation. They could put some pictures, you know. Um, there's another thing on there that says, um, collect, hit the FUBOTs or the foo, foo targets. Um, and there's no picture of what they were. So when I first got the game, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what this means. Shoot the foo targets. Uh, okay. Um, you know, just should, just put a little picture on there. That would, that would help it out. Um, the modulator design, I don't know anyone that's played Foo Fighters, but you hit the van and upgrade and there's that little, um, there's three drop targets and then you hit it and smash it and you keep upgrading your van and it's just like random colors, right? I have no idea what my upgrade is going to be. I have no idea what level it is. If I hit it once, twice, three times, four times, it leveled up four times. It's like, oh, red means this, green means this, blue means this. There should just be like an LED there or it should be really big on the screen that says, boom, now you qualify for this. It's got to say one, two, three, four, five times something it's got to give you something better than just a color because i have no idea what's going on there right and i don't have time to hey i can read the rule sheet and know that red means this green but it's like man that's work dude and even at that i feel like i'm gonna forget during the game like because i play so much pinball on fridays and, and other places it's like i'm not gonna remember that green means i'm level two on something um even side loop i don't think people realize when it says side loop on foo fighters People don't know what that means. Does that mean the left ramp? Does that mean the actual side loop, right? Like people don't know what side loop means. So I think it says on there, shoot the side loop for some something or one of the modes says to do that. Uh, I wish there was something that would show you the highest scoring shot in the play field. Um, again, in some of the modes on Foo Fighters, some of the shots, if they're stacked or even if they're not stacked, one shot could be worth 5 million and the other jackpot that's lit is 3 million. So it'd be nice to know which one exactly, like, do something different, really fast flickering colors, whatever, that says, like, this is the shot, man. This, this is what you want to be going for uh, in, in some way. Oh, it was bots. Yeah, shoot the bot targets is what it was for the rule sheet. Nobody knows what the bot targets are when you first get it. 
Um, Jersey Jack, I think that's a horrible experience. I wanted to say is like their scoring system, dude. They just need to multiply everything by ten. I meet people that go, man, I played, yeah, I played that game and I played for like a couple minutes. I only got a hundred thousand. That sucks. I don't want to play that game. They literally, it's just psychology, dude. Just bump the scores up to turn style scores. People, this is one of the reasons why people walk away from your thirteen thousand dollar games. I mean, just have a play test, dude. Go to a bar and talk to somebody and don't tell me you designed Jersey Jack game. I'm telling you, dude, they will tell you why they don't like Jersey Jack pinball games. Um, yeah, I also hate um, some of the jackpots in Foo Fighters. I think all the lights used to flash. I don't remember if it still does, but some of the games, it's like, oh, jackpot, you did it. And then you don't know where the next jackpot is because everything's lit up. It's very annoying. It's a terrible experience again. If I hit a jackpot here and then the next one's going to go over there, I want to see this light go away and I want to see that light light up. I don't want to see everything go crazy. Um, you know, not just expression lights. I'm talking about the playfield inserts. I want to know what shot I need to go to next. Um, in Foo Fighters, the cutscene movie clips, um, if I hit a jackpot um, and then I hit another one or something happens, I don't even get to see what my jackpot was, so I don't even know, like, it has to play an animation that breaks, like, some kind of robot, and then the thing comes in and goes away, and, like, I have to, you know, once I hit a shot, I usually look up to see what I scored, and if it's taken three seconds for you to show that score, well, I gotta get my, my eyes back down to the play field to see what's going on, I, you know, I'd like to know what I'm scoring and learn how the score systems on games work, you know, it's not just Foo Fighters for that, um, dude, free play games, so the bar that I go to is a free play bar where you press start and it just adds as many players as you want, right? These little kids press start. Then you have four player games, they play a game and then it's screwed. Now you have the left flipper. If you hold the left flipper and start button, it'll reset the game, but some people don't know that. And some of the older games don't. So um, I have other ways that I could bypass that for add a player and or remove player. Even if they just put on the LCD screen, hey, uh, you know, if, if nobody's plunged the ball in 20 seconds and nobody's playing this game because they know, hey, there's a ball there and I don't want to plunge it 15 times so that I can reset the game, it should just say, hey, uh, player unattended, press these two buttons to reset the game. It's not that complicated, but I'm telling you, I teach, I've probably taught 30 people that too. It's like, oh yeah, you can reset a game, you do this, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think a longer high score list would be pretty cool. Um, you know, you only see the top 10 players, and they're usually like way up there. It'd be cool to see, uh, I think, store maybe 100 or whatever. Let someone scroll and see, like, how good they are. Because a lot of people have no idea if they're good or bad. Uh, is this a good score? Is that a bad score? Like, maybe the last 100 scores on the entire machine. Not just high score, just maybe put a list of people that's like, here's the last 50 scores. And you go, oh, okay, well, I'm kind of, like, okay or you know, compared to other people. Because obviously the top scores are going to be the top players. Um, people come from downtown Tampa that are like world champions and they'll come to this bar and put their initials in and then it's like, cool, I know I'm never going to beat that, but I'd like to know if I'm like better than 90% of the people that come in here or, you know, where I rank on the game. Actually, that'd be a good idea, I think. Um, of all the games, go over all of them and then when you finish a game that says like, hey, this score was better than 10% or 100% of the people, like, you would know how good you are at that game. And you could aggregate that online, too, with, like, Stern Insider Connect. You could know how good of a ball that was. One other thing I'm going to do, too, is when you play a game, it's going to tell you everything you did to get that score. So when you finish the game, you'll be able to export and download online and say, okay, he did this thing, and then he did this, which gave him double scoring, so these five shots were double scoring, and here's the jackpot. Because sometimes, <clears throat> dude, when I first got Foo Fighters, my actual best score, I think, was 500 million it's like i got it the first day and i never got it again and i don't know what i did i know the code changes and sometimes they make it a little bit harder but it'd be cool to see like the top player exactly how they got the score and which way and help you learn or know how you got your scores because again sometimes it's you not it's not readily available why you got that score or if you had two times scoring sometimes it's not lit or you just don't see it and you're like how did i get the score i have no idea why is the shot worth 50 million points Oh, it's because this was stacked and I had a four times multiplier. And oh, okay. So it's not just he's a good player. He had all this other stuff. And that's why that shot, you know, put him way in the lead. Um, for modding games, uh, I'm thinking to have like a direct port where you could plug in, like tap into a wire line. Um, so like if a jackpot happens or super jackpot, if you were like making a toy mod that you want to put on one of my machines, um, it would send like a data signal and you could read that. 
and um, it would let you know like, hey, this this happened, so do this. I don't know if we'll follow through on that or not. We'll see. Um, you know, I do have uh, one thing I forgot is I do have plans to release all my games virtually with my pinball design software. So pending licensors are like okay with that um, for licensed themes. Um, I'd like to, yeah, have every game out there on the internet for you to play. Um, you can try it out before you buy it. You, if you want to play it before your game ships, like you can learn the rules, whatever, you know. I think that's uh, another small, you know, we're talking maybe a couple bucks, two ninety nine for a game or something, I don't know. Um, I don't know, maybe a small price, maybe free, I don't know. But I'd like to put them out there so people can play the games and ex experience it and learn it. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate anyone that's still following. Again, dude, you're talking maybe another year. It sucks. I'm not going to lie to people, though. I'm not going to take people's money. Uh, I'm not going to put other people's money into my company. And um, I'm not going to launch this company until you see 20 games lined up in my house. Potentially 10 of those one game and 10, of, 10 another. Uh, I'm going to plan to have my custom shop fully up and running. And if I do any... Um, the day I launch... Um, if that's at like an expo event, um, I would like to actually have the community or one well-known person come, say Carrie Hardy or something, designs a game in this software, just whether it's quick or he's really into it, spends an hour or he spends 10 minutes. I want to take that game, press a button and watch you make me that, watch that game get made in real life by all my machines and assembled by me and I'm going to bring it the next day. So that's kind of what I'm looking at doing. Um, even with the artwork, I can get the artwork printed maybe at a local shop. Maybe it's not the same material I'm using, but I can at least have playfield art for that day, assemble the whole game and, and show it off to the world and show how I'm going to build a custom shop. So anyway, guys, um, I appreciate your time. And if you made it this far, thanks.